Thank you for downloading episode 37 of the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast. If you enjoy Murder Mile, listening to the authentic sounds, imagining the sights, and wishing you were actually there, well, if you're ever in London, why not join me for my five-star rated guided walk of Soho's most infamous murders and absorb the sights, sounds, and smells of Soho for real. Tours are every Sunday at 11am and feature many stories you will never hear on the podcast. Ooh. For tickets, click on the link in the show notes. Thank you for listening and enjoy the episode. Welcome to Murder Mile. A true crime podcast, an audio guided walk, featuring many of London's untold, unsolved, and long forgotten murders, all set within one square mile of the West End. Today's episode is about Larry Winters, a loving son, a soldier, and a violently disturbed psychopath who never got the help he so badly needed. And in a moment of madness, he destroyed two lives forever. Murder Mile contains shocking details, which may make the delicate go do lally, as well as realistic sounds, so that no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael. I am your tour guide. And this is Murder Mile. Episode 37 The Wasted Life of Larry Winters. Today, I'm standing outside of the White Horse Public House on Rupert Street in Soho, W1 one road west of the old Compton Street deathbed of Dutch Leia, one road east of the Salted Almond Cocktail Bar where Greta Haywood met the notorious Blackout Ripper, and one road south of Brewer Street where Soho sex workers Ginger Ray and Margaret Cook were last seen alive, and where Rosa O'Neill was viciously stabbed to death by a deaf and mute murderer coming soon to Murder Mile. Originally built in the 1720s and rebuilt in the 1930s, the White Horse has stood on the cobblestoned corner of Rupert Street for almost 300 years. And being a four-storey building of sandstone brick with a dark wood facade, frosted glass, brass fittings, black double doors and a defunct Victorian gaslight above. As much as Soho may change, this pub has remained traditional inside and out. Barely 50 feet long by 50 feet wide and dominated by a central bar island, so broad when the pub has 60 punters in there's barely enough room to breathe. With a familiar smell of stale ale, meat pies, sweat, bleach and body burps. A tobacco stained ceiling which looks like some old geezer painted it with inch thick phlegm using his cancerous old lung. Tables stabbed with several decades worth of flick knives, knuckle dusters and six inch stilettos. And a bar so sticky that to pick up your pint you have to turn it and twist first. Having barely changed in decades, the White Horse truly is packed full of history, character, stories, and even the odd murder. As it was here, on Sunday the 14th of June, 1964, in the bar room of the White Horse public house, where 21-year-old Larry Winters... Do you know what? Why am I telling you this? 
Let me show you. As the fading sun dipped below the western end of Shaftesbury Avenue and the last crack of light plunged Piccadilly Circus into a disorientating mix of auburn twilights and shuffling silhouettes, its reassuring warmth no longer soothed Larry's exhausted face, as slowly a dark chill set in. Although, like many young men, Larry was usually tidy and trim. But today, with his eyes all crusted up with sleep, his fuzzy brown hair a tangled mess, and hanging off his five foot nine inch frame, was his crumpled dark suit, white shirt and black tie, which was etched with an odd crisscross of lines, as if he'd slept for a bit, but not in a bed. Larry was tired, hungry, and broke. For the last 24 hours, Larry had aimlessly walked around the West End, as the endless streets of Soho scuffed his once shiny shoes. With no money in his pockets, no food in his belly, and a thick Glaswegian accent, which told the world that this desperate young man was stranded 380 miles from his Scottish home. He didn't ask for help, and he couldn't, as having a bulbous nose, sticky out ears, and eternally smirking lips, Larry was a wanted man, on the run, who was easy to spot. As Larry slinked off Shaftesbury Avenue, and up the shadowy cobblestoned road of Rupert Street, being bathed in lurid neon signs that flashed a steady stream of unsubtle single-syllable words like sex, nude and girls. Although he was a young man, Larry wasn't here for that. But with a second night of homelessness and hunger looming, he knew that where there was sex and drink, there was money. Illuminated by a Victorian gaslight. Through its frosted glass, Larry spotted barely a handful of slightly tipsy drinkers, all of whom were being served by just a single barman. So with this being a usual quiet Sunday night, the white horse would be an easy target. As his hand slid into his canvas army knapsack, pushing aside a well-thumbed poetry book, a battered notepad and a stubby pencil, he grasped at the little gift he'd brought home for his brother. A brown wooden handled, matte black, 38 calibre Enfield Mark I service revolver. He knew how to hold it. He knew how to shoot it. And although six bullets sat in the barrel, he knew he wouldn't need any. With speed and surprise as his ally, he'd rush in, hop the bar, ping open the till, grab the cash, make a dash, hop on the next train to Glasgow, and with nobody hurt and the police none the wiser, by dawn he'd be home. It was a simple plan, fueled by hunger, thirst and tiredness. And as his fingertips tingled, his brain thumped and his vision grew hazy. Larry pushed open the black double doors of the white horse to commit an ordinary robbery of an ordinary pub for the usual ordinary reason. But then again, Larry Winters wasn't an ordinary boy. And although this incident would change the life of Larry Winters forever, this is not the end of the story, and it's certainly not the beginning.
taken from his prison diaries. The earliest memories of Larry Winters are at best patchy and at worst vague. So whatever is a truth, a lie or an exaggeration is up to you. Born in Townhead, on the eastern end of the bustling Scottish city of Glasgow, on the 21st of March 1943, Lawrence Costigan Winters was one of three siblings raised in a loving, loyal and devoutly Catholic working class family. As a sickly boy, Larry spent much of his formative years bedbound in Glasgow's Royal Infirmary staring at the bland hospital ceiling as he pleaded for his mum to come and take him home. But every day, the doctors said no. Being imprisoned and trapped by the hospital ward's cold stone walls, with bars on the windows, locks on the doors and uniformed guards on patrol, as often as his mother Mary questioned these quacks about why her little boy was ill. Being too arrogant to simply say, we don't know, these doctors would trot out that same old vague phrase of he'll probably grow out of it. But sadly, Larry never did. Larry's turbulent childhood started with a simple headache a dull throbbing pain, probably caused, the doctors thought, by eye strain. A thundering heart rate, so acute it caused his fingers to tingle. And as a dark red mist descended over his blurry vision, being in the grip of a violent and uncontrollable rage, the terrified young boy would be struck down with anxiety, paranoia, blackouts and hallucinations. And yet still, the doctors did nothing. As a highly strung and easily aggravated boy, having been misdiagnosed and being unmedicated, Larry, led by his older brother Don, soon descended into loutish destruction, petty thuggery, and minor misdemeanours, such as fighting, stealing and vandalism. All punishable by being roughly manhandled by a policeman and frog-marched home to be shamed in front of his mother. On one undocumented night in the early 1950s, as Larry and Don restlessly strolled down Glasgow's North Frederick Street, kicking cans, cars and cats. A gang of young bruisers cornered the two boys and demanded money. Larry had nothing to give and nothing to lose. So with his fingers tingling, his head pounding and his heart racing, Larry smashed a glass milk bottle over the ringleader's head and grinned as the blood oozed down the crime boy's face. Seeing them slowly slide into petty crime and wanting only the best for her two boys, with her husband having begun a new job as a groundskeeper, the Winters family left the squalor of the city behind and uprooted to the stunning Carbisdale Castle in the Scottish Highlands. And with the air being clear, clean and crisp, the landscape an intoxicating array of colours, sights and smells, and being free to swim in the lakes, to run through the fields and to climb up the trees, here Mary's boys began to flourish. In his diaries, Larry talked of his time at Carbersdale Castle as one of the most wonderful parts of his childhood. And being closer to his beloved mother, and further away from his fears, his temper quelled, 
His hallucinations halted, and his panic attacks got less frequent. But nestling in the murky mess of his mixed-up head, the dark demon sat, goading him to stab a deer with his knife, to stomp rabbits to death with his boots, and never telling him why. And with the season almost over, and the greenskeeper's job now ceased, the family reluctantly trudged back to Glasgow, to the grit, the grime. The crime and the gangs, and soon afterwards, the old Larry Winters returned. Being ticked off by upright teachers, dictated to by dipshit doctors, and picked on by pushy police, although Larry was a bright lad with a deep love of poetry. Being easily bored and restless, he bunked out of school, regularly engaged in knife fights, and having begun a career as a petty criminal. By 1957, aged just 14 years old, Larry was sentenced to two years at the notorious Larch Grove Romance Center. And once again. Being trapped by four stone-cold walls, with bars on the windows, locks on the doors, and uniformed guards on patrol, Borstal was the worst place for Larry to be. And being separated from his beloved mum, who'd asked the staff what was wrong with her little boy, they'd simply trot out that same old vague phrase of "he'll probably grow out of it." But sadly, Larry never did. By the age of twenty, unable to curb his aggression, he had notched up five more convictions for theft and violent assault. In early 1964, a few months shy of his twenty-first birthday, being eager to instill some discipline into his own troubled life, Larry enlisted in the parachute regiment of the British Army. And was posted to the Maida Barracks in Aldershot, 35 miles southwest of London. What he wanted was structure. What he needed was medication. What he got was more walls, more doors, more locks, more bars, and more guards. And being barked at by bullies day in and day out, as happy as Larry was that he was holding down an honest job and posting money home to his proud mum. Inside his head, the dark demon sat, goading him to stab, to shoot, to kill. But with Britain's war over, and no enemies left to fight, all Larry had was routine. Ridicule, and a bubbling rage. On Friday, the twelfth of June, nineteen sixty-four, in an unprovoked attack, Larry beat a fellow soldier into unconsciousness with his fists and feet. No one knows why, not even Larry. Fearing arrest, having packed into his canvas army knapsack. A well-thumbed poetry book, a battered notepad, a stubby pencil, and a thirty-eight caliber Enfield Mark I service revolver, as a gift for his gun-loving brother. Larry snuck out of Maida Barracks, and deserted the British Army forever. Larry was heading home, to Glasgow, and to his mum. But having blown almost a pound on a ticket to Waterloo, and a tube ride to Euston, having arrived at the train station, he realised that he was two pounds too short to afford the five-pound fare to Scotland. And so, being hungry, tired, and broke, Larry drifted 
towards the bright lights of Soho. Being stranded in a strange city with no friends, no family, no funds. As the sun set over Shaftesbury Avenue on the evening of Sunday the 14th of June 1964, with his shoes scuffed, his throat parched, and his brown suit crumpled, having fitfully slept the night in an abandoned Soho sex cinema. As homelessness and hunger loomed once again, Larry ambled into the nearest side street and entered into infamy. Illuminated by a Victorian gaslight, the White Horse on Rupert Street was just an ordinary pub on an ordinary street which he'd neither been to before nor would ever return. And being full of ordinary people who Larry had no hatred, no malice and no grievance with, with speed and surprise on his side, no one would get hurt. And as his fingertips tingled, his brain thumped, and his vision grew hazy. Larry pushed open the black double doors of the white horse to commit a very ordinary robbery. But then again, Larry Winters wasn't an ordinary boy, just as Paddy O'Keefe wasn't an ordinary man. Patrick O'Keefe, known as Paddy, was a 37-year-old Irishman who'd been raised in the roughest parts of Dublin, had served three tours of service in the formidable Irish Guards, and as a bull-headed barman who turfed out every type of tosser, loser and lowlife, out of some of South London's dodgiest clubs, pubs and snooker halls. Although not physically imposing, Paddy exuded authority. Smartly dressed in a dark brown suit, a crisp white shirt, a neat black tie and shiny black shoes, with short trimmed hair and a clean shaven face, Paddy was the epitome of a professional barman. And to any punter, in what he regarded as his pub, you abided by his rules or you were out. On any other day, Larry and Paddy might never have met. But by chance, they did. Bursting open the black double doors, before the first scream had blurted past a pint of lukewarm ale, Larry had leaped over the Bar Island's sticky wooden surface, and armed with an Enfield Mark I revolver, he brusquely barked, This is nobody, I want your money! As his left hand swiftly reached for the cash till, his right kept control of the terrified customers. But having never worked in retail, and with no knowledge of cash registers, as Larry furiously pounded the till, thumped the buttons, and hoped that his fists would force great plumes of cash to fly out, Paddy sidled up from the other side of the bar island, his chest puffed out, and his knuckles white and tight, as his cold glaring eyes fixed on this little shit who was robbing his bar. Feeling a dull ache in his brain, as the pain burrowed deep, and the rhythmic pulse of blood thumped like a madman hammering on his head. With the till remaining stubbornly shut, Larry barked, Open the till! The gun's barrel aimed squarely at the unflinching barman's chest. But calmly, Paddy retorted, No.
And that was it. Their whole interaction was just four words. But that is all it took. Never had two men hated each other so much so fast. But having never met before, it wasn't who they were that they despised so much, but what they represented. As years of hate were condensed into less than seven seconds. To Paddy, Larry was just another little toe rag, a tyke, a shite and a scrote. A wastrel with no brains and a loser with no rules. Who every week, with a boot up his bum, Paddy would kick out into the street. To Larry, Paddy was just another authority figure. A doctor, a copper, a guard and a warder. Who stood in his way, had told him no, and always kept him from being with his beloved mum. As both men stood eye to eye, inches apart, and unwilling to back down, as the hot, moist stench of Paddy's breath scalded Larry's face, with his head throbbing, his pulse racing, and his fingers tingling as it gripped the gun's trigger, as a red mist descended, before he even knew what he had done, Clutching his chest, Paddy staggered backwards. His face flushed with shock as sharp arcs of blood spurted between his fingers and stained his crisp white shirt a dark shade of crimson. Being gripped with giddiness and going ghostly white as pint after pint of thick sticky blood trickled down his panting chest. As Paddy's unsteady feet stumbled on the rough wooden boards, he fell. It was said he was dead before he even hit the floor. With the cash till unopened, Larry fled empty-handed. But as an easy-to-spot army deserter, he was swiftly arrested at Euston Station, trying to sneak onto the last train home. On the 16th of June 1964, 21-year-old Larry Winters was charged with murder whilst in the furtherance of a robbery, a crime punishable by death. But having been declared insane by a psychiatrist, who'd stated that he was an abnormal man with violent psychotic tendencies. On the 31st of July 1964, at the Old Bailey, a jury found him guilty of manslaughter owing to diminished responsibility. And with Justice Stevenson concluding that he should be put away for the protection of himself as well as the public, Larry Winters was sentenced to life imprisonment. But of course, as I said at the start, although this murder would change the life of Larry Winters forever, that was not the beginning of his story, and it certainly wasn't the end. What Larry wanted was help. What he needed was medication. But what he got was more walls, more doors, more locks, more bars, more guards. And for a clinically insane, mentally ill man with an uncontrollable rage and a hatred of authority figures, prison was the worst place for him to be. On the 27th of May 1968, in Aberdeen's infamous Peterhead prison, Larry was one of four ringleaders who led a violent and bloody riot, during which he stabbed three prison officers and a civilian instructor with a set of tailor's scissors. Found guilty of two charges of attempted murder and two of assault, 
Larry was sentenced to a further 15 years in prison, added to an already indeterminate life sentence. And being unable to curb his violent psychotic rages, finally, he was prescribed medication. But not the kind he needed. And being eager to keep him doped up and docile, they dosed him with an addictive daily cocktail of strong sedatives. On the 29th of December 1972, Larry attempted to escape from Inverness Prison in what should have been a simple plan. But when confronted, he stabbed four prison officers in the back, chest, neck, face and eyes using a makeshift dagger fashioned from a sharpened table fork. He was found guilty of four counts of attempted murder, which increased his sentence by a further 26 years. And with his head throbbing, his pulse racing, and his fingers tingling, the more he got hopelessly addicted to prescription drugs, which failed to quell his anxiety, paranoia, and hallucinations, the more he became dependent on harder drugs hoping they'd make the voices go away. On the 16th of March 1973, nine years into his incarceration, and almost a decade after the murder of Paddy O'Keefe, Larry Winters was transferred to the notorious HMP Barlini Prison. A cramped, squalid, overpopulated, rat-infested powder keg of drug addicts, rapists and murderers. So infamous, feared and hated, Barlini had earned a place high up on the list of the world's most infamous prisons, alongside Alcatraz, the Bangkok Hilton and Wormwood Scrubs. But seeing his mental health rapidly decline, Larry was moved to Barlini's special unit, a pioneering facility dedicated to the treatment of ultra-violent prisoners, which used medication and therapy in a calm and friendly environment, where the guards were tolerant and respectful, where days were full of open doors and fresh air, and Larry's recovery was supported by education, empowered by recreation, and was rewarded by supervised visits to his home, his friends, and more importantly, his mum. And it was here that reading poetry and writing his diaries, Larry began to flourish. But by then, it was too late, and the damage had been done. On Sunday the 11th of September 1977, 34-year-old Larry Winters was found in his cell, slumped naked on the toilet, having overdosed on sedatives and choked on his own vomit. Of the few papers who carried the story, most described him as a thief, a murderer, and most notoriously, as one of Scotland's most violent prisoners almost as if it was a badge of honour. But what they'd forgotten was the truth. The mental illness of Larry Winters had been misdiagnosed and had gone unmedicated for almost three decades. And no matter where he went, what he did, or who he hurt, Larry Winters was simply just this. A frightened young boy, desperate to go home, to be with his mum. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. Don't forget to stay tuned to Extra Mile after the break but before that here is my recommended podcast of the week 
which is yours in murder. What do you want in a true crime podcast? Do you want well-researched material, but an easy-to-follow format? Do you want a bit of dark humor, but want sensitive topics handled, well, sensitively? Do you want hosts who are lactose intolerant, but eat macaroni and cheese anyway? Well, I think you might be looking for us. I'm Rachel. And I'm Rebecca, and we're the hosts of the true crime podcast, Yours in Murder. And this isn't any old true crime podcast. I have a background in forensic science. And I have a background in journalism, so we're able to combine our knowledge and bring you interesting new perspectives on cases. Not that we're all serious. We have a bit of a dark sense of humor. Just a bit. I mean, we like morbid jokes and cat jokes. Lots of cat jokes. So if you're looking for something new and a bit out of the ordinary, check out Yours in Murder. You can find us on all of your favorite podcatchers, as well as iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and TuneIn. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or check out our website at yoursandmurder.net. We hope to see you soon, and until next time, we are Yours and Murder. This week, of course, there is always a big thank you which goes out to my new Patreon supporters who literally days before everyone else gets murder location videos, crime scene photos, and also little extra pieces from myself, as well as a personal thank you from me. This week's star of Patreon is Kim Nixon. Kim, I bless you, the world blesses you, and Murder Mile blesses you. May you stay safe and happy forever. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult with No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. Hello? Who's that? <gasps> Is it Extra Mile listeners queuing up outside like all in an orderly queue, desperate to listen to Extra Mile? Yes, it is. We're all standing here outside in the cold waiting to hear some Extra Mile. Well, well you are in luck. <laughs> Welcome to Extra Mile. Um... For new listeners, uh, this is the waffly bit. This is not the structured bit that you've just listened to, which takes bloody hours every week. Ugh, it took five days to write that this time, and I'm just about to start editing it, so God knows how long it'll take. Uh, this is the unstructured bit. It's just a bit of fun. It's not compulsory, but I delve into more info about the story itself, so uh, you're welcome to stay with us. If not, no problem at all. Uh, go off and have a good evening. Save yourself some time. But for everyone else who loves Extra Mile, <laughs> there seems to be a lot of people who enjoy it. Uh, this is Extra Mile. Uh, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that. That was the case of Larry Winters. Um, that was one of those stories that I used to do uh, on my tours at the very start. Uh, anyone who was uh, joined the tour at the very start when it was a lo- much longer three-hour tour instead of the nice tight two hours. Uh, and anyone who came on the ill-fated pub crawl version we did. Oh, dear Lord, that was horrific. To anyone out there who came up... W- if you came on the pub crawl version of Murder Mile, it was around Easter and the first year that I did this. If you came on that tour, that was the only time I ever did it. I never did it again. Never wanted to do it again. It wasn't your you guys' fault. It was just, it, oh, God. You just can't booze and do a tour. We can't do my tour and booze, I don't think. It needs to be a cheeky tour, whereas I'm kind of a bit more reverential to victims and... Uh, Oh, it was Saturday night and it was, oh God, it was horrific. Never doing that again. So, yeah, no, so this case, the story of Larry Winters. Um, uh, I can't remember where I first heard about it. This was a long time ago. I think it was probably a news article or something. Um, oh, yeah, no, it was. It was a news article which basically said it was about, they kept referring to uh, Paddy O'Keefe, the barman, as a crook tamer. It was a tabloid shitty article where they're going on about that he was a crook tamer. And basically the story was that he could 
he wouldn't need to talk to anyone. He would just put his palms on the counter and he'd stare them out as a lion tamer would take down a lion. Ugh. And then he would stare them out and then they would run away because he was so terrifying. And basically the headline was Crook Tamer Meets His Match or some bullshit like that. Um, so I used to do that on the tour. Then I took it out for time. And then I, uh, I went to do it in the first season for Murder Mile. But the problem was the case file just wasn't there. It's not in the National Archives. Well, it is in the National Archives, but it's held for, uh, for 100 years, which means it's not available until 2064. So it's a real pig. Just not having the information of what is out there isn't reliable there are some newspaper sources mostly concerning the peter uh the peterhead riot uh the prison riot uh and his later cases but about this story itself there's very little there's very little about paddy o'keefe the uh uh the barman and there's very little about larry winters as well so um I had to use various sources to try and make the story work. Uh, luckily, Larry Winters kept a diary, which was good. Although it's not, it's not a great diary. It's not on today. I did this. I had a poo, and then I went out and shot someone. Because uh, he was into poetry, it's 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 very much about his feelings, about how he feels. Uh, so, if you want an insight into his brain and his workings around that time, then yeah, you know that's that's fine. But if you want to know what happened on the night of the murder very little so i had to piece it together using fragments like that uh fragments of information uh from other prisoners who uh were with him in the various prisons he was in uh interviews with various people so it's bits and pieces there. it was a real hodgepodge hence at the start i do say that because it's hard for me to define what's real and what isn't and what's exaggerated in here so i've i've kind of what i've done with this story is I've tried to tell you it from Larry's perspective so everything is from Larry's eyes which is why especially especially at the start as we're going through the murder it's quite flowery it's quite florid it's kind of it's poetic in almost the way that I've written it because it's from Larry's perspective it's his not rose tinted but his kind of world that we're in so therefore I've made it a little bit more it's all about him so there may be many sections in there which are completely wrong could be completely wrong but until we get access to that national archives file or any of the uh court transcripts we will just never know so hence this story is kind of a um a kind of a hunter s thompson uh fear and loathing in las vegas style retelling of the life of larry winters uh there is, there is actually a, a film out there called what's it called there's a film with ian glenn Oh, God, it's a British film from years ago. God, I remember watching it in the 90s, and it was horrific. Horrific in a good way, uh, but it's about Larry Winters. Oh, it's called Silent Scream. That's it. It's an, almost impossible to get because it's a British film, which means it wasn't distributed properly, which means it probably went on about five cinemas. Uh, but it's it's told in a very chaotic way as well. It's based on his diaries, and it's told in, in fragments, as, also, as fragmented as Larry's brain is, from what I remember. So uh, if you want to, you can watch that. It's called uh, Silent Scream. Larry, it's based on Larry's diaries, which are also called Silent Scream, which is where they get the title from. Uh, but I base this primarily on Larry's diaries, really, what there is of them. Uh, they're, they're, they're still available now. Um, I think there's still one on uh, Amazon, I believe. I got mine from like an old um, charity shop in there, um, uh, down in South London. There's loads of... A guy seemed to be very into uh, prison diaries. Uh, prison diaries, you know, prison stories, stuff like that. And it was just tucked in there. I had it for years. Didn't, re didn't really know what it was until I went searching for it. And there it was. So, uh, Larry Winters, let's... So, so much of the information of his early life is really hard to track down. So, uh, and because of time, obviously there were some things that I had to take out, which was a real shame because there's some really cracking little bits in here that I wanted to get to. And they actually appear at the end of the story. Now, I'm yet to edit this story. So, obviously you have to accept that whilst I'm talking to you now, I've no idea what's going to be edited out. The last episode, the one prior, the one about uh, Helen Pickwood, the abortion one. <gasps> God, that took me five days to write, another two days to rewrite. Uh, having already recorded it, and then I had to re-edit it and re-record re it. 
So it's a good episode now, but it was bloody awful at the start. So I had to cut a lot out. I had to make it fast. And I think I'm going to have to do the same with this one. I've rewritten this episode a lot, but I think I'm going to have to cut a lot out. So I've no idea what's going to stay in. So if there is still references to the Peterhead prison riot, uh, which happened on the 27th of May 1968, of which Larry was one of the ringleaders, uh, I thought I'd read you some of the articles that were in the newspapers. Uh, It said uh, three prison officers and a uh, civilian instructor were injured. Uh, Four men were charged. They were Larry Winters, David McCracken. I've read this previously, hence why I'm flying through it. Uh, rather than stuttering over it. Uh, Robert Duncan and James Youngston. Uh, Thursday, the, it happened on... So, uh, Thursday, the 25th of July, 1968, they were in court in uh, Aberdeen, I believe, for that. Uh, Larry Winters was 25 at the time. He was found unanimously guilty guilty by a jury at the High Court in Aberdeen, yeah, on two charges of attempted murder, two charges of assault, even though he was already serving a life sentence and he was sentenced to a further 15 years in prison. Lord Thompson said uh, he had a criminal he had a criminal track record stretching back to 1960. Um, it was actually earlier than that. He should really have checked properly. Um, uh, and Larry was un, unmoved as he, and he left the dock smiling. Um, his co-conspirators, uh, McCracken, Youngston and Duncan were all found not guilty of rioting at Peterhead Prison. Uh, Winters was found guilty of attempting to murder prison officers Norman Ritchie and Robert Wallace by stabbing them with scissors and assaulting prison officer Mitchell Cool and Thomas Taylor, who was the civilian tailor. I deliberately left it out because if you're going to have a tailor, a tailor called Taylor, it just makes the story slightly funny, which is uh, wrong. Um, now, from what I remember of this, where is it? I've got details on this now. Um, so one of the prison officers does give a description of the attack. So there was, uh, um, what's his name? His name is Richie. So Norman Richie was 23 years old, was a prison warder in there. He had his nose broken uh, by a blow to the face using a pair of scissors, using a blunt fisted end. Um, and as he was on the floor, Larry was kicking him and he felt a blow to his back. So as Richie, it was like a, um, Winters was raining down blows on the prison officer. Um, as the prison officer managed to get up, he felt a thump in his back. He ran downstairs to sound the alarm. Uh, he had to struggle past loads of prisoners. There was a riot going on. Uh, there was loads of co-conspirators in there punching the prison officers and kicking the shit out of them. And as he was running along the roadway, the prison officer was running along the roadway, he heard the sound of scissors falling onto the floor. And it was only then that he realised that he'd been stabbed in the back using a pair of scissors. And these are obviously tailor scissors, which are big and huge and they have two very sharp metal blades they're used for very precisely cutting material so they're very sharp um and he was stabbed in the back uh larry winters denied murder uh attempted murder um and even though this happened in a second story building inside peter's head prison uh larry winters said that he was on the ground floor uh and he was having a bit of a smoke at the time um Obviously, there was quite a couple of uh, prison officers got uh, badly beaten at the same time. McCracken, who was one of the co-conspirators, managed to grab one of the um, uh, the prison officers' batons. Uh, was standing there grinning um, as the prison officer received uh, blows to the head and neck as he tried to get out. Um, prison officer uh, had to make a 32 mile journey journey to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary where he was given two pints of blood and st- had to stay in hospital for two weeks um, now obviously uh, Winters denied this and he said he was uh, he said he was not guilty he said he had nothing to do with it um, he had a witness who goes by the name of Mad Boy Dugan real name John Hepburn Dugan who was 37 uh, who claimed that the uh, Claim that he was involved in the riot and the and the violence, blah 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 blah. Um, all twaddled. They just didn't believe him. Even though uh, one of the prison officers was struck, uh, they say using a wooden object. I read in one document that it was a, a, a table leg. Um, but you know, uh, so uh, Larry Winters was found guilty of that. He was the only one that was. The rest of his co-conspirators, not at all, were fa- weren't found guilty at all. Um, but while they were waiting. Uh, for the 
obviously for the police to turn up. Uh, the prison officers decided to take their revenge, had cornered, had actually pinned them to the floor, had cornered them, and then decided to kick the living shit out of them. Apparently, Peterhead was a notoriously violent prison. If you if you type in Peterhead Prison Riot, the 1968 one won't be the first one that pops up. It will probably be 1973, or it could be 78, or there was one in the 80s as well. It's like a notorious, really bad Category A prison. Um... Now, there's also a little bit more information on the uh, the Inverness escape that I mentioned in there. Obviously, I, I cut that down to like a paragraph. That might not be there anymore. Who knows? Uh, if it's not, um, on Friday the 29th of December 1972. So Larry had been in prison since we well, had been in there for like seven or eight years by that point. Um, after the escape attempt, four prisoner four prisoners were handcuffed in hospital after an attempted escape from Inverness top security prison unit uh, four prison officers were also in hospital one with a serious eye injury after an attack using a table fork shark sharpened like a dagger and and other pieces of metal fitted with makeshift handle, handles as stabbing stabbing weapons yeah. um, Lawrence Williams uh, sorry, Lawrence Winters, uh, Larry Winters, uh, as well as William McPherson, who was charged with arm, uh, an armed robber, uh, who was 28 years old, James Boyle, who was in, in prison for life for murder, uh, and Howard Wilson, um, who previously had murdered a policeman, uh, which is, in nineteen pre-1965, that's one of the few crimes which would mean you would be sentenced to death. It doesn't matter whether it was using a gun or in pursuit pursuance of a robbery. If you murdered a policeman with a knife or your fists or your hands, instant death sentence. Obviously, this this one had happened. Uh, I don't know much about Howard Wilson, but uh, obviously that must have happened pre nineteen sixty and definitely nineteen sixty five because the because of the abolition of the death penalty. Um, during the attack, uh, Larry Winters received a broken arm. Um, they made the escape attempt uh, while they were in the recreation ground. It was only a small segregation unit and there was only really space for about five men in there. Um, so it was a small space and they tried to overpower the four guards who were there uh, watching them. But it was thwarted as other prison guards actually heard the violence going on, dived in and, and beat the shit out of Larry Winters and his co-conspirators. Um so it says that uh, Douglas McIntosh received a, a severe eye injury. Uh, these are all the prison officers. Durham Lawrenston uh, had stab wounds in the back. Bob Marshall, neck wounds. And William William Armstrong, stab wounds to the body as well. Mm. So I didn't actually put that in the story. Even though I really wanted to, half of me was really, really keen on interesting, you know, because I love playing with sounds at the moment. You probably noticed that. And I really wanted to do a prison kind of riot one, but there was just no time for it in the story. Um, I'm going to have a swig of water. I've run out of tea. I know, I've run out of tea. What's going on? Uh, I hope you enjoy Murder Mile at the moment. Um, if you've noticed with the other episodes, what I've been doing is... I've been having a bit of fun with sound. So, if you're listening to... Uh, I think most speakers now are, are kind of mono, they're stereo now, and they sh you should have left and right speakers. So what I've been trying to do over the last couple of weeks is ha is really play with the stereo sound. So even though I, I, I don't have a complicated system where I can create surround sound, I'm trying to fabricate my own surround sound in your ears. So... On the Helen Pickwood episode, uh, almost knocked over my speaker. On the Helen Pickwood episode last week, um, you probably noticed that when uh, there was the sound of the train when she was going off to meet Captain Tickle, uh, the toss pot. Uh, what I did was I I got identical sound, uh, which is not a stereo sound of uh, a train moving away, an old steam train, and I duplicated it, and then basically I put. Uh, one in the left speaker and one in the right speaker and then basically I cross faded them over um, so what should happen when you're listening to it is you should hear the train moving from the centre of your hearing to the right depending on what ear you've got the speaker in but also still in the left but slightly fading while the other one goes up so it should be 
I'm trying to create kind of artificial surround sound, which hopefully that's worked. Um, I, I kind of did it with the um, Brian Alexander Robinson one, where the, the violence was happen happening outside the, the club, and you heard all the bottles smashing. Uh, what I've done did with that one, I did the same. I had some bottles on your left ear, some bottles in your right, and then I changed the pitch and the tone. So it sounded like they were hitting different parts around you. Hopefully that worked. I don't know. And also with with the conversations last week with the uh, the assassination of Abd al Naif, um, I did the same. So uh, Abd was probably in your left ear, and Kazim was in your right ear. So it sounds like a left-right conversation. I'm kind of having fun doing that. Uh, if it's working, let me know. Because um, I, I test it out using my earphones. But it's just just be nice to know if, if uh, however you listen to it, whether you listen to it in uh, on like a uh, an iPod or in your car or, or do you know whether you have a nice... If, oh, if you have a nice fancy surround sound system if you're one of these posh people who who listens to your podcast in a nice lazy boy recliner chair and you've got quadraphonic surround sound and all the tweeters and all lovely stuff like that give it a go let me know if it works i'd love i'd love to know if it, if i can if it works in that kind of system hopefully it does uh i think my dreams one day would be to if i could if i could create like a more fancier system for murder mile is maybe to you know really really go to town with surround sound um, but at the moment, it's just it's just simple old stereo. But I'm having a bit of fun using it, so I, I hope you're enjoying that. It takes a lot of work, but you know what? It, it, it for me, it's exciting. I like that challenge of thinking, starting each episode and thinking, right, I've no idea how to edit this. Uh, I think I did all right with the Alan Pickroad one. The first version of that was bloody awful, really, really boring. But I think I nailed it. I think I'm having fun, so I've no idea because this is because the Larry Winters one is all about his psychopathy and his kind of paranoia and hallucinations. I don't know. I don't know what to do with it. I don't think it'll be a standard story. I don't know, but maybe. Oh, I hope I've got time. This is Friday night again. I'm I'm two days behind. This story took five days. Uh, the last one took about four and a, yeah, last one took about four and a half. It took an extra two days to edit this. I probably won't be edited till Monday or Tuesday, I reckon. Um, but uh, I, um, I do you know what I've I've said to myself, even though I'm behind at the moment, and even though I'm running out of time, uh, I've said to myself, do you know what? I would rather, I would rather have a good episode go out and me to be late or even the episode to be late or me just to carry over a week and put out an extra mile and say I'm sorry I can't give you the episode till next week I'd rather you had a good episode a week late than a shit episode on time I just think there's no point in putting out a shit episode especially for me I, I won't be happy with that so, it, so it, it has to be a good episode um, I think I enjoyed this one it was a bloody hard one to write um, I don't think I could find a way into it that was the problem I couldn't find the emotional way in on the first draft when I was getting in there there's a lot of information I just couldn't get it right and it was just I just didn't emote to it uh, and then maybe I'll put this out as an extra but um, I think I kind of found it as I was getting nearer the end as I was writing it the first draft so I had to go back and rewrite it and rewrite it again so hopefully it's back in there but it when I realized that this wasn't a, a story about a guy who was psychopathic and it but it's really a story about not only is it a story about a man who's got mental health problems and he's just not getting the help that he needs this don't forget this is kind of 1960s so you know early days of mental health really it's really just not regarded properly and pe people are just being shunned aside the sooner the sooner i realized that really this was his stories emanate from the fact that he was a sick boy in hospital and that he, as much as his mum would try, he'd never get released. And as soon as I realised that this was a story of like a young boy who just wanted to be with his mum, I think that I think I made it. I think I helped me write it. I might put this out as an extra. I, I might not because it's slightly embarrassing. Uh, I struggled with the last line. It, it took me about it took me about three minutes to say it. Because it is. 
if you think of it, oh, come on. It is a kind of a sad thing, do you know, that he is, that, that's all he is. He is just, he's just a little boy. He just wants to be with his mum. And that's all it is. I was going to talk more about, about that, but I don't think I will. Ah, fuck. Uh, so, uh, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, see, it has worked. It, it's hard, hard to write the end of that story. Oh God, no! Now I'm getting all upset. Oh, fuck. Okay. I'm not going to go into it anymore. Sorry. Okay. So. Ah, uh, uh, exciting week! Hey, segueing into something exciting. Uh it's been a good week for Murder Mile, uh, which is nice. Do you know, we've tried really hard, and um, uh, iTunes has been on the front page of uh, iTunes. What well, my my brain has gone now. Uh, Murder Mile has been on the front page of our iTunes, which is fantastic. Uh, so, yep, page one. We're on the the new and notable section, uh, which was really exciting. Um, uh, so yeah, if you go on the front page, I don't know whether it's in other countries, but definitely in the UK, which is very great. So up there at the top, uh, we also made it into the top four, top 70 of iTunes shows, which is really exciting. Uh, so the audience figures are slowly going up. We're getting new listeners, which is very exciting. Obviously you are the, the, the number one listeners cause you were there first. Uh, but welcome. If you're a new listener as now, well, welcome to the, welcome to a uh, uh, murder mile and extra mile. You probably tuned out already. Uh, so thank you to everyone to, who listens to murder mile and especially those who leave reviews. Um, it, it, even though I know you hear it all the time, you hear a lot of people say, please do leave reviews. It really does help us. It really does. Do you know, being on the front page of iTunes is, it's an algorithm. It's kind of an algorithm that, you know, um, if you uh, if if you get enough traction and enough speed uh, based on reviews, then it can be boosted up to the new and notable section, which is great. So actually your reviews really do make a difference. So anyone who leaves reviews, thank you so much. If you fancy leaving a new review, p please do. That might keep us on the front page of iTunes even longer. Um, um, and also it'll ha help me keep Murder Mile going on longer as well. Um, obviously, I don't really make anything out of this. It's a full-time job, uh, and I don't make much out of Patreon, uh, out of Murder Mile, except from the the lovely people from page, Patreon, my Patreon supporters. Thank you so much to absolutely every single one of them. Uh, your money each month really is very much appreciated. Uh, I would love to say I, I waste it on booze. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't. Uh, but it goes to cover my costs. So I, I have a lot of costs for like uh, traveling to and from the National Archives. Um, uh, the British uh, Newspaper Archive census, census reports, and also my web hosting as well, uh, which is very expensive. So uh, it's great. It takes a lot of pressure off, and it really does help me. Uh, I, I, I don't make much from the adverts at the moment, um, uh, unfortunately. Uh, hopefully one day, or when I get more traction on the on uh, the podcast, that would be great. Uh, so there might be a slight curb on competitions at the moment. Uh, thank you to everyone who's won so far. And when I say curb on competitions, little boat going past. Um, what I don't mean is uh, there won't be any competitions. I think because I've been doing it as five questions and there's five winners, and you know, because I send parcels all over the world, sometimes it can cost me uh, twenty pounds, which is at the moment is 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 a lot of money. It's the kind of money I don't have. So what I might do is do competitions, but there'll be one winner. I've got a competition ready for the. Um, the Helen Pickwood one, which I'm really excited about. I will have no control over who the winner is. I'm leaving it all to you. So anyone who is a uh, uh, a follower on the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast discussion group on Facebook, um, there's a link in the show notes. Uh, pop onto there um, and uh, uh, join us. Uh, and the competitions are on there as well. I sometimes might do them on my other Facebook account as well, but at the moment they're on the discussion group. Whew. So, um, had a, uh, lots of nice feedback from people about about my writing and my writing style. And obviously, you all know that I I, I spent many years trying to be a writer and failing. Well, not really failing, but you know, not really getting the 
big praise that I guess everyone wants when you're a writer. So, um, as I know that there's a lot of you out there who are very creative, whether you do music or or, uh, or pottery or art, God, I'd love to be able to paint. Really would. My gran is a really good painter. Well, she used to be a really good painter. I don't think she does anymore. Um, but I, I'd love to do that. And uh, for years, I've always wanted to be a writer. Uh, have always struggled, and it's only since Murder Mile, really, that... Oh, Murder Mile and my little plays that I've kind of found... Do you know, it's only now that I'm kind of... This has turned into a career, really. So what I thought I'd do, um, for all aspiring creative people out there, no matter what you're doing, um, basket making, uh, pottery, um, anything, whatever you're doing, I thought I'd give you uh, tips, on uh, my tips on just trying to make a career out of it or, or even just making it and turning a hobby into something that you enjoy and something that you can make money out of because um, it doesn't need to be big and huge you don't need to pick up a guitar and go i'm gonna be a rock star i'm gonna be as big as bono do you know what having a guitar and just sitting in your room by yourself enjoying the fact that you're making nice music or the fact that you're you know, yesterday you couldn't play Stairway to Heaven, but next week you're pretty good at it. That's a success. That is a success. It's not being in Wembley Stadium and playing to hundreds of thousands of people and making millions. Because as we all see with famous people, that you know, that kind of success does not lead to happiness. It's a, it's about being happy within yourself. So these are, I'm just going to go through kind of things that I've learned over the years. Um, and it it really is about just making yourself happy. It really is. So let's um, let's go through this. I've I've kind of scrawled stuff down um, because you, 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 uh, if you're going to be a writer, um, just write. Just sit down and write. Don't don't be. I apologise for my language. Don't be one of these twats who sits in Starbucks with their MacBook Slim out and spend all of their day tweeting. I'm writing a novel. If you sit in a starbucks and you do that you you're not writing a novel what you are is being a burke okay writers write sit down and write okay and this is how you write really really simple rules okay it's taken me years to learn this it really has I, i've been writing since probably before my teens right and i only really started to really i'm not even anywhere at the moment but i'm pushing forwards and pushing forwards with a career at the moment so these these are kind of my tips okay rule number one this took me years to learn this one entertain yourself it's that simple it really is don't think about an audience don't think about who you're writing for don't think about about who's going to read it at the end don't think about agents don't think about anything else just entertain yourself if you're writing a book just sit down and go i'm writing a book to entertain myself that is it that's all you're doing and and by doing that you make sure that you uh your internal editor isn't on if you sit there and go okay i'm going to write this for my friends and you go oh my friends will hate that oh edit delete 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 bollocks to that i don't give a shit about what people think about what i write and i know this seems selfish but it's it's priority number one i am the first audience i'm the first person who's going to hear it the first person who's read it so i go out to entertain myself and even though sometimes like, people do complain and they go oh I, you know i found that offensive so what i don't care <laughs> i really don't care because i'm entertaining myself and if people want to come on the ride with me and you guys do and i absolutely love that I love people coming on the ride with me, but I'm not going to edit myself or tailor any of my writing to anyone's needs. If they don't like it, they can go and write their own. And really, most people should. <laughs> so entertain yourself. That really is it. If you're going to sit down and write something, make it as, as dark, as florid, as disgusting, as emotional, as happy as you feel. And if it makes you laugh and it makes you cry that's all that matters that really is all that matters at all it's about you you being proud within yourself uh rule number two um that, obviously that goes with music as well just just entertain yourself uh, and anything you're doing rule number two uh don't tell anyone what you are writing yeah that's a really important one i learned that very quickly i remember going and telling some friends to say oh i'm writing this is a book that i'm planning on writing and they went you know what would be a better idea? 
And instantly everyone does that. Instantly everyone tries to cut you down. Doesn't matter whether they're friends or family, they instantly want to cut you down because they've heard your idea for 10 seconds, maybe five seconds, and instantly they think they know better than you even though you've been working on it for a year. And the worst thing that can happen for creativity is self-doubt. So believe in what you're doing. Don't tell anyone anything about whatever it is you're doing until you've finished because they will ruin it. They will absolutely ruin your creativity and your drive. Just believe in yourself. Just sit there and entirely believe in what you're doing is right and just power on with it. Um, but hang on. I'm, I'm slightly reading ahead just to make sure that I haven't... Uh, okay, yeah, rule four. Okay. <laughs> rule three. Don't worry, there's only five rules. I haven't done, I haven't done a billion of them. Um, don't think about the outcome. This was all, always really important. This was where, if you go back to the, the original um, Extra Mile episodes, I think that's where my uh, writing crisis came from, my inability to write when I spent three months staring at a flashing cursor, uh, was because I was trying to write screen, uh, scripts, comedy scripts, and because I'd spent years working in comedy, I knew that everyone I knew who worked in comedy and the department I used to work in would probably end up reading the script. And I always... I it's in, I, I, it wasn't conscious in my head, but I know that I probably sat there unconsciously thinking, oh my God, what are they going to think when they read this? They're going to think it's shit. Why has he quit his job and his whole life in order to go off and write this shit? And I think that's where I just, it was just entire self-doubt. I could, I had no belief in myself at all. And I just worried about what people thought. So um, don't think about the outcome. That's absolutely the last thing you should ever think about don't think about the outcome don't think about the rewards don't think about getting a publisher don't think about getting an agent don't think about what money you're going to make all of it is irrelevant and none of it you have any control over anyway you really don't you have absolutely no control so going back to rule number one entertain yourself just make yourself happy that's all it is um just go through the if you write a whole book finish the whole book just finish the whole book, make yourself happy. Um, Nothing is Impossible, which is a book I've mentioned before, which is, uh, I've written loads of books over the years. Many of them will never see the light of day. Uh, I would say the best one I've ever written by far was Nothing is Impossible. It's the book that got me through depression. It's the book I wrote when I had, uh, whoa, bottle fell over. Uh, it's the book I wrote in order to help me get through depression because I had writer's block and I used it as an exercise. I was like, let's just write write 500 words a day and hopefully it'll help me get through it'll help keep the keep the black dog away uh and it it became amazing it was like i really it was such an enjoyable exercise because i wasn't worried about any of it i was just like here's something i'm gonna i'm gonna write about this today it was like different sections this i'm gonna write this bit today and i didn't give a shit about how whether it offended people or whether it was lewd or rude or didn't give a shit I just sat down and wrote and it was 350 odd pages and I would say every single page I love. I I, I hope one day to go back and reread it because uh, I remember rereading it uh, about two years ago when I was rewriting it and I loved every day of rewriting it. It was such fun. And that's because I didn't think about anyone else. I just thought about me. It's my book, I'm, I'm writing a book entirely for me and it's honest. It's very honest. It's a very honest book. Uh, which is also, I guess, why I like doing extra extra mile. It's you know, it's it's an honest section. Uh, it's unscripted, except the bits where I just, which I just read earlier on, which is scripted. But this is all unscripted, except the notes I'm looking at now. I'm slightly looking at notes. Uh, so uh, nothing is impossible. I will probably, even though I said I might publish it, I probably will never publish it. I don't know. Maybe I, you know me. I change my mind all the time, uh, but I just don't want it ruined. Do you know what? It's it's like it, it's something special for me. And what I don't want is just toss pods out there. Do you know the Internet is just full of wankers who will no matter what you do, they will go out and they will criticize it. And it's my personal thing. So maybe I just maybe I just won't sully it by having people who don't understand ruin it. So, uh, yeah, it might just stay for me. I, I Do you know what? Some things don't need to be out there. I think there's too many people out there in the world who say, I'm writing a book and, and they spend all their time thinking about getting an agent and, you know, the, it'd be, you know, the rights being sold for a film. Whereas really what they should do is just enjoy the process of being creative. That's the enjoyable thing. I think if I didn't enjoy 
murder mile i probably wouldn't do it anymore but i enjoy it it's challenging and it's entertaining and it keeps me very happy and i make no money off it but you know what i'm happy and that's priority number one so uh again going back to rule number one entertain yourself <laughs> uh, rule number four um a very important one if i touched on it earlier on don't let anyone read it until you've totally finished it same with doing a piece of music same with doing some art there blah, blah, blah. don't let anyone see it hear it touch it because they will ruin it they really will they most people have no idea what they're talking about but they've always got helpful ideas on how you can improve it sod them it's not about them it's about you it's about you enjoying yourself it's about your creativity it's like me on the roof of my boat. I always say this. If you have a look at the roof on my boat, um, I painted it myself, okay? And the, <laughs> and the sides are all wobbly. Uh, the, the the fine line tape that I'd put down to make the lines neat on the side, it, I, it didn't stick properly, so it's all wibbly wobbly. The paint on the roof is it had a sheen of dust on it that I didn't wipe off, so it's all starting to crack. But you know what? It's mine. I did it. I did it and it's my mistakes and I, I enjoy my mistakes so um and do you know what I've learned my lessons for next time that's an important thing about creativity that I've learned is I never regard anything that I've done as either great or shit I regard everything I do as modestly successful failures because every time I'm learning something I never considered like what i'm doing now like the plays i wrote uh edinburgh i never expected to win an award at the edinburgh fringe festival i didn't expect loads of people to turn up because it's all about learning it's like i did the show it was exhausting but i learned for the next show and then i moved on and i did the next show and i moved on and then a lot of the edinburgh fringe show helped me create murder mile this podcast and although this isn't an end product and i know that Murder Mile will lead to something else. Just as the tour, the tour led to the podcast and the podcast will lead to something else. And then that will lead to something else. So it's all about, it's about learning your mistakes and developing and moving on. And don't be afraid of making mistakes as well. Mistakes are a great thing. People spend all of their time punishing themselves for, for doing wrong or, or for making mistakes. Mistakes are important. I love mistakes because without mistakes, you don't develop. If you're perfect to everything and you're great and you just keep going, I'm great, I'm great, I'm great, you're an idiot and you'll just collapse because you'll never see the mistakes. You'll never see failures are important. It's It's about developing yourself and you can't develop yourself unless you make mistakes so uh every single episode i make mistakes uh and i try and learn from them uh obviously i don't listen to the early episodes because they make me cringe although every episode makes me cringe i hate the sound of my voice uh where do we get to yes so don't let anyone read it or see it until you've absolutely finished until you're absolutely 100 percent. it's locked away and there's nothing they can do about it anymore if you want it in the world wait until that point and then send it out and if people have notes, fine, they can give notes, but it makes no bloody difference because you're finished. <laughs> so uh, if they want to write their own fucking book, they can write their own fucking book. It's as simple as that. Uh, rule number five. I put a caveat on this one. Rule number five, the final one, ignore reviews. Now, the caveat is take the kind words that go with it. There will always be people out there who, like yourselves, who are really kind and really supportive. And, you know, everyone who sends me really kind words, I always reply to them because, you know, it really, uh, you know, sometimes we have bad days and it really buoys me up and I really appreciate it. And it, do you know what? It's nice to hear from you. Um, it's a lonely job as a podcaster. I'm sitting here talking, effectively talking to myself, really. Um, and I spend like 60 hours a week by myself in front of my laptop uh, talking to myself, writing to myself, editing to myself. Um, so, so do you know what? On the on the few moments I do get to do some social media with the project, it re it is really exciting. It's really nice to hear from you, and especially to people who come on my tours who are listeners as well, and to to get to meet you. If if you come on my tours, as when we meet outside Tottenham Court Road Tube Station, please do say to me, "I'm a listener." Um, it really does really does mean a lot to me, uh, and. Uh, etc so I, I i drifted off then <laughs> i was thinking of something else um yes yeah, so ignore the reviews but take the kind words as i said there's always going to be idiots out there even so i've just made it onto um 
the iTunes Top 100. And on the front page of the New and Notables, which is very exciting, my audience figures are going up. Within the first day, I got four one-star reviews. And I guarantee you, none of those people have actually listened to an episode. I guarantee you that this is the... The internet, unfortunately, is full of full of great people, but also full of whiny shitbags who really, you know, they hate other people doing well. They hate other people achieving things because they just sit in their little basement getting all upset and, you know, because they've because they haven't done anything with their lives. You know, the kind of people who blame everyone else for the fact that they're not working or they don't they're not in a relationship or etc. You know. They're always going to be toss pots out there. So yeah, no, I got four, four, probably five one-star reviews already, only on the British site. British site, yeah, yeah, my people, bastards. Uh, I haven't checked America yet. I will do very shortly. <laughs> um, but I guarantee they have not heard an episode. They just hate the idea of it being on page one and iTunes saying to them, you, this is popular, you have to listen to this. I'm sure instantly they saw, saw that and went, right, instantly I hate it. Or, you know what? Maybe they listen to Murder Mile. Maybe they do hate it. But you know what? It's not for everyone. Uh, so take from reviews uh, what you feel. What you feel is right. Uh, and same with criticism as well. Like cre Creative criticism, there's good things and bad things. If people truly understood what it was you were doing, they would be doing it themselves. They wouldn't be criticising it. So it's easy for people to criticise. It's very hard for people to sit down and do things. So so whether you're a painter or a potter or you make bikes or whatever it is you want to do, just do it. Just do it. Do you know, even if it, even if you only have like an hour spare a week or two hours a week, just sit down and do it. Have some fun. Enjoy yourself. Don't worry about how it looks. Don't worry about people looking at it. Don't worry about like looking at it. Like when you start off, if you're painting and it doesn't look good. So what? Just have fun. That's what. That's why I love murder. Mile. I just have fun. Oh dear. So, um, I mentioned on the last, ooh, last murder. Mile, maybe the one before that. I was still stuck on how to say goodbye at the end of murder. Mile. Um, so, two people have been very fantastic. Uh, Melanie Godgel and Dan Borley. So they have both come up with uh, suggestions, which is great. So. Uh, Dan has given three and he split them into different categories, which is very nice. So Dan says he's got three. One, one's cheesy, one's professional. Uh, and he's got a last one listed on there as well. So uh, the cheesy one is that's another extra mile in the file. Maybe I mis misphrased that. That's another extra mile in the file. Yeah, I don't think it needs a space, does it? Uh, that's another extra mile in the file. What do you reckon? Does it work? Nod, shake. Hmm, don't know. Uh, pro he's, there's a professional one, which is uh, that's it for today's podcast. Thanks for going the extra mile with me. Th uh, thanks for going the extra mile with me. We'll do it again next week. What do you reckon? Good. Yeah, Dan says there's another one he did which, uh, of which the pun doesn't quite work, but I get it. Which is uh, thanks for listening this week. And thank you for being part of the Extra Mile High Club. I like that. The Mile High Club. Uh, I have joined the Mile Low Club. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was in the Eurostar. Um, we won't talk about that <laughs> on this episode. Uh, but yeah, oh, that was an interesting day, that was. Um, <laughs> I don't think the people who... Uh, Went on. Do you know what? I'm not even going to go into that story. Uh, and lastly, uh, Dan says, uh, lastly, uh, to fit in with the alliteration, because I do love alliteration. Um, don't forget to make Murder Mile your first thought on Thursday. I quite like that one. Don't forget to don't forget to make Murder Mile your first thought on a Thursday. Mm -hmm. I quite like that. That's really good. So thanks, Dan. Really appreciate those. Those are really good. Um uh if anyone else has any more please do let me know uh melanie sent one in as well it was a really nice really nice uh message that melanie sent me melanie who's also one of my patreon supporters thank you very much melanie uh melanie said uh she likes a really nice simple one uh and hers was until next time be well which is really nice i like i kind of like be well i kind of agree with melanie on this There's something nice about be well be happy be supportive 
Um, so yeah, I really like this. So th thanks, guys. Th thanks, Dan. Man 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 <laughs> I can't say the words. Oh, again. See, I'm getting all blocked up again. It's because of the end of the show, because I've been talking for two hours straight. <gasps> You've been listening for almost two hours straight. I pity you. I pity you. So, um, I... I've asked people for Q&A questions. You're welcome to send through any questions to me at any point, and I will answer them on Murder Mile. Uh, and uh, we only have one this week, uh, and that is a question from my lovely girlfriend, Eva Green. You probably, uh, if you watch films, you probably know Eva Green uh, from films like Casino Royale and uh, Sky's The Penny Dreadfuls. Yeah, that, Eva Green, yeah. Uh, uh, we've been dating for a long time. Uh, <laughs> so, and Eva's question is, why can't I, it's a three-parter, why can't I stop thinking about you? Why are you so damn sexy? And when are we going to make sweet, when are we going to make sweet whoopee boom boom again? Well, Eva. Oh, she wrote, P.S. Thank you. Love the show and your sweet ass. Well, thank you, Eva. Uh, that's very kind of you. Uh, question number one. Why can't I stop thinking about you? Well, we uh, we have been an item for a long time. I know it's not in the papers. I know people don't talk about it. I know because you know, you're a successful Hollywood star and I'm just a fat, bald podcaster that you, you know, sometimes it can be embarrassing for you to admit that we're in love. But we are in love. We've been together for many years. So that's why you can't stop thinking about me. And our love is true. It's not fictional to anyone listening. I swear it's not fictional. Uh, second part of the question, why are you so damn sexy? Well, if uh, sexy, by sexy you mean uh, fat and bald, then yes, I'm very sexy. Uh, and when are we going to make sweet, sweet whoopee boom boom again? Uh, hopefully tonight. Turn up. I'm here. Oh God, am I here? So, <laughs> um, um, yes. Uh, <clears throat> so, hope you enjoyed uh, uh, Murder Mile and Extra Mile for this week. I have no idea what next week's episode is going to be. I've got a list. Uh, I've researched loads. Uh, I think I know which one it might be, but I'm not too sure. Anyway, I hope you enjoy that. Um, should I use one of the sign offs? Yeah, okay. Uh, let's use. Okay, I'm going to co I'm going to combine two of them if I may. So uh, this sign off is by Dan and Melanie combined. So here's my sign off, folks. Uh, thank you so much for joining in, and don't forget to make Murder Mile your first thought on a Thursday. And be well. Cheers, folks. Bye.